Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. That's D-O-M-I-N-K-N-O-W dot com. Now, here's this week's episode. Oh, there we are. There's our Wednesday morning earworm. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. Hello to everybody in the chat. It, uh, for those of you in America, of course, it's the day before what's well, Thanksgiving Eve day today, isn't it? So. Uh, I think a lot of folks have already started getting into that mode. Here in Canada, we like to think of these next three days as our most productive days of the year because most of our Domino clients are, a lot of them anywhere, based in the U.S., and suddenly we don't get emails for for several days in a row, and we can zone in on on projects. uh, (laughs) So it's sort of a holiday, you know, too. It's an email holiday up here, uh, in a way, for us, so. It is. Whenever one country has a holiday, it like, sort of ends up being a holiday for everybody. It's kind of by yep. default. But it's holy a... smokes, we've got two guests today, Chris. Did you know we do? <laughs> it's it's crazy. Normally we only have one, but we're two guests for the price of one. Uh, double your value this week on on the idiotic uh, session. So yeah, um, we have Kavi Thanakun and Latasha Wooten with us here, um, and I'll give you guys both a chance to introduce yourselves. Latasha, you've been with us. Uh, before, so I'll start with you, Latasha. Give us, uh, give us your biography. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, first, hi everyone. I'm I'm calling in from Virginia. Um, so, as you mentioned, I have spoken here before um, about a presentation I did at DevLearn. Um, so, I've been in the learning industry. I would say about five years now. I was kind of introduced at my previous company. Um, it was a, a an accounting training firm, and that is where I truly fell in love with e-learning and authoring tools and the whole kind of process behind the scenes. Everything after the storyboard is completed, then it's handed to me. That's when I'm like, yes, I can I can create videos. I can do audio. I can create these really cool interactives. Um, one of my favorite projects to this date at that company was creating a course based off game board. So I got to create some really cool, fun things. Um, and then I've gotten the opportunity to speak at different conferences, and now I'm a learning experience designer, um, and I'm getting the opportunity to kind of be on the other side of creating content and actually getting the time to really think about what's best for our learners. How can we make the experience enjoyable, and how can we ultimately change the behavior? Um, And so that's a little bit about me. I'm excited to be here with you all today. Uh, Thank you so much for having me again. Oh, and we're very glad you're here. Um, and, and Kavi, introduce yourself to our uh, to our audience here too. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting. Um, I was born and raised in Sri Lanka, so I'm not from the U.S., even though I'm calling in uh, from a few miles off San Francisco. Um, yeah, so I sort of have had my feet on both sort of ends of the world, I guess. Uh, both here uh, sort of in North America and also sort of in the South Asia region um, and communities there. I, in fact, started in sort of the development social impact sector, um, but was doing learning experience work without knowing it was called learning experience. Um, So I was actually teaching sexual and reproductive health uh, to adolescents and uh, kids, uh, which was what I was doing. Um, or work related to that space, so really a grassroots education um, and that kind of work. Um, then went into anthropology and film, uh, which was where I got my training in, um, and then realized, well, there's so much of anthropology in learning. It's about really understanding where learners are at, what learning means to people, um, how communities interpret what learning is. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and I realized there's so much sort of design and anthropology involved in learning. Um, So then just moved and decided I wanted to explore the space of ed tech um, and then moved into sort of education and technology. Um, 
yeah, so have mostly focused on not the learning and development side, which was interesting um, to kind of be in this community since the past sort of few months, uh, because there's so many learnings that could be moved. Um, so mainly worked with kids, so five to 10, um, and also designed for social impact um, sort of organizations. So that's been a lot of my work. Yeah, it's interesting. Cool. We've got two ends of the spectrum, which is fantastic, which made this really fun when I was started reaching out to um, groups, uh, you know, individuals that are in the 30 under 30. Your names popped out at me just as your titles, you know, and I already obviously I already know Latarsha. She's been here before. So I I, uh, I knew she would have some great insights into what we can talk about today about the industry. But then I saw learning anthropologist and I thought, I so hope she wants to hang out with us, too, because that's that's going to be fun. Because I, I, I love the sort of the fringe edges of our industry and a lot of folks. We've talked about this before, right, Chris? There's so many people come into the industry from really strange odd directions and sort of stumble into saying wow this learning thing is kind of cool there's actually research behind it there's a degree there's you know there's people that do this for a living right and and then the next thing you know it's uh, you know you're having a good time learning new things and then getting to hang out with people uh you know like the 30 under 30 crowd maybe we could start there and um, you know, just each jump in, Latarsha, I'll jump back to you and just have you, you know, how did, how did that fall in your lap? Um, I think that's like the key thing. It, it was kind of like one of those moments when, you know, you, the whole process is you submit an application and uh, I didn't, at first I wasn't going to, if I'm being completely honest, I was like, I've, I've followed it for years. I knew about, it. I'm like, these people on this list are like, amazing like they have done some really impressive things people that i follow on social media i was just like i can't do it and my manager was like why not i was like because like have you seen the list of the previous years have you have you read their their linkedins and followed them i have um and she was like so what i was just like okay yeah. um and the application was really interesting just in the fact of their questions like they weren't like traditional questions they was like asking about diversity and learning and where do you see yourself? There were questions I had to like stop and pause. There weren't like things I could like, oh, let me just type something. It was more like, okay, where do I see myself in five years? Um, a lot of people get asked that question, right? And like, yeah. even in interviews when you're getting a job and you're like, I don't know, I'm just, you, you just kind of like, you don't think, but for this moment, I had to like really reflect on where I wanted to see myself. Um, and then, as I thought about it and I was kind of pondering, I had my manager, like I talked to her about it. I was like, I don't know. Like, and we had to do some exercises to kind of figure out like where I really wanted to be. And I submitted my application and later on I found out, I literally was in shock. Like I was like, I had my husband read it. I had, I sent it to my manager. I was like, is this real? Um, and then when the list came out and I got to research and look up other members of the cohort, I was like, oh my gosh, these, these, these individuals are so like, they're, I can't wait to see what change they, they implement. Like this industry is in really great hands. Some of them have done amazing things. And just to think we're all under the age of 30, like if we can do this much in what we probably graduate in 21, if we could do this much in seven, eight years, imagine what we're going to do with a career. Yeah. Very, cool. Very cool. How about you, Kavi? How was that process um, for you? I think for me, I once had um, a conversation with somebody from um, an education technology company. Um, Marshall, no, we'll skip brand names today. So I'm going <laughs> to very, very like, tricky line. Um, and it was just a mentoring call. Um, and uh, she currently um, is the vice president of a large user research company. Um, and when I was talking to her, one of the first things I saw on her bio was this 30 under 30 learning. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, she's so cool. <laughs> um, and I'm sure it's just a cool person. I was like, oh, she's done this really cool like, conference. That's when I sort of, it came into my radar. Because um, I think still I'm trying to understand, because 
the community here in North America is, is a community, right? And you need to understand like what's happening here, um, what are conferences people are going to, what are people talking about? Even though I've had that in in South Asia, like I really don't understand what's going on here. And I was like, oh, this looks kind of cool. Um, two years after that conversation, it just, something popped up on LinkedIn. And I was like, oh, this is kind of what she attended. Uh, looks cool. I uh, completely forgot about it. Um, and then remembered it like a day before the deadline. Um, and I wish I put thought into it and really like, um, like did what you did, Latasha, like really like thought about it, but I really didn't. Um, but the questions were very intriguing. I totally agree with you on that. Um, and they asked me like what I would be in five years. I was like, I don't know. Like, maybe you'll tell me, hopefully. Um, but yeah, and when I got the email, I thought it was spam. So I ignored it for like a good five days. Oh no. And then I was like, wait a second. This is that thing I applied to and it's real. <laughs> um, and then I like fantically, like, I think I replied back and I was like, hi. Um, I will gladly <laughs> accept. <laughs> That's it, it's interesting. You 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 had the the one day realizing the deadline, and uh, and, and Latasha had the longer time frame and sweating over it and, and, and agonizing, etc. And I, I kind of think maybe Latasha might wish in some ways she just had the short term. I'm being honest. I I I submit it super late. So why I was ag there was a short period of like stressing about it. it was a short I was, like, agony. Not doing it. Yeah, I was like, I'm not doing okay. this. So I kind of like. Towards the end, I was like, this is it. Like, I got, like, one week or two weeks. And, like, if you don't do it, you don't do it. And I'm almost 30. Like, I have one more year. So I'm like, is it now or never? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I wanted to, about 10 years ago, I wanted to, when Elliot Maisie first started this whole 30 under 30 thing, I remember thinking to myself, because I was already past 30, uh, I was like, you know, I'm going to start one, too, and I'm going to call it the the 40 almost 50. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll find find everybody who's, you know, find forty people that are almost fifty and uh, and make a list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, of course, I never happened. But I still want to do it. <laughs> you should do it. Yeah, you really should. Because I think this age barrier that you have to do a certain thing before you're thirty. Um, and I talk to my mentors who are like in their forties and fifties. They're like, this is kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, so you should do it. I will hold you accountable. Oh, excellent. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've, um, I, I have a lot of a lot of my Twitter feed are writers, etc. And, and then so there's lots of similar kind of lists, you know, 30 under 30 is a common kind of theme in various you know industries. And then um, every few months or so, probably during that, you know, the season of these kinds of, of, of things, etc. Po people point out, hey, look, so and so didn't do something, you know, didn't do their first novel until they were 57 or, you know, or whatever. So don't, it's never too late, you know, to, to, to start something. So there is kind of um, um, an artificiality in a sense of these kinds of, um, you know, brackets. But um, I really do think, though, that it is really important because um, you go to conferences and um, uh, an awful lot of the conferences, very, very same faces that are, uh, you know, on the stage doing sessions and, and doing, you know, things. I mean, there's always, there are always like some new, uh, but it really could be seen, you know, that we have an industry full of folks who already have achieved a certain level of, uh, you know, of, of knowledge and, and experience. And therefore, they're the, you know, the, the, the names that you see in, all, in, in the conference sessions. And it really is critical for us to make sure that we are fostering in our industry um, yeah. you know, new faces, new perspectives, new, uh, new enthusiasms too. So, um, yeah. so, and, and you both yeah. talked about how neither of you actually kind of took the, 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 the email confirmation very I, either. I'm not going to, I'm going to say take it very seriously, but that sort of, um, that, that moment of, of not really believing that it, uh, that it actually, you know, was true. Um, so, so what happened next? I mean, the conference was last week, right? Um, and, and I think uh, Latasha, you were mentioning, um, it was online. Um, maybe get you both to share your, your experiences then with the, with the, the conference itself. Yeah, sure. Um, so the conference was supposed to be live in Orlando. Um, and so they changed it last minute due to some policies that had changed in Florida. So um, they end up making it a week long conference um, virtual. Um, and so from I'm Eastern. So like from 11 a.m. my time to like five, we're like just sessions back to back to back. Um, and so unfortunately, because I work <laughs> 
because it's virtual. Uh, so balancing the conference and work, while I did limit my amount of meetings and things like that, it just work and life kind of take place. And so mm -hmm. overall, I really enjoyed the conference in the sense that it got me thinking about leadership in a way that I haven't thought about it. Um, I know that's probably bad to say, but like I kind of just was going through the emotions of like how you kind of proceed in your career. Like, but I never a lot of people was um, a lot of the conference really shaped around being active in your leadership, right? Being present and aware of your actions and what to do and how to find mentors and to believe in yourself and know that you're enough and all these different components to really shape what what they thought leadership looked like. And I me being someone that, you know, obviously we all have our idea of what leadership is. Me being someone that was like, oh, I'm still young. I have time. I have time for that. I have so much time. Um, but in actuality, you probably should start thinking about that now, you know, and leaders, in my opinion, isn't someone with necessarily that title. Um, it's someone that their team can depend on that is helping to support team members. It's someone that is um, people can account, be, um, count on. And I think that's really important and empathy and the fact that you can have compassion. Um, and also I'm a remote worker. So thinking about leadership and how I can contribute to my team members, even though I'm home and some of them are in the office. Like, I think, you know, last week kind of really helped me kind of think about leadership in different ways. And what do I want to be as a leader? What do I want people to refer to me as? So, um, it was a pretty, it was pretty intense. I'm not going to lie. Hmm. Conference all day for that long period of time with no breaks. Um, it was, what? It was they didn't give you a... breaks? <laughs> Virtual like conference? No breaks? <laughs> it was like 15 minutes between each session, but I'm like, I, that's not enough time. So I have to respond to emails and all that good stuff. But yeah, yeah I will say as one thing, while my experience was really positive, I do think converting it from a live session to in um, live to virtual, I feel like there was a little bit of, um, there's some lessons to be learned in like the interactivity with the participants, maybe including some breaks, um, making it a little bit more engaging instead of just, you know, basically. Did you, did you guys as a group, place. as, as the 30 under 30, did the 30 of you get together in a chat or have any sort of back yes. channel while you were, you know, there and being able to just kind yes. of stay connected? How did, how did that work out for you both? That was actually really cool. Um, and Kavi can definitely speak to it. Um, we created a channel. Um, we even had our own sessions, which I thought was really cool. Like imagine meeting people that you follow, like leaders in this industry and getting to like get that one on one. We got the opportunity to listen to David Kelly. I was like, oh, my gosh, David Kelly's right there. <laughs> um, just because I've seen him in a lot of my conferences and like um, it was just kind of cool just to get their take on leadership and what, you know, their advice is and how should we be moving forward. So I thought that was one of the the coolest parts about it, like that that personal touch that they that they had. Um, they also did happy hours. Unfortunately, it was during time I couldn't join, but <laughs> the, the team, the cohort definitely got the opportunity to meet up. Yeah. And Kavi, how was um, how was the conference experience for you? Um, I think for me, it was very different and interesting because I don't come from this space. Mm. Um, and I think it's strange when you're going to, uh, I mean, it's obviously learning as a whole, but I think I work with a very different a group of learners in a very different learning context. And then I went and I was like, oh, I, I don't know if a lot of these things are applicable. But I think a lot of the questions around how do we make learning journeys uh, personalized to learners? How do we meet learners where they're at? Um, what role does data play in kind of measuring learning? Is it even possible to measure competency? Like, what does that mean? Um, I think a lot of these questions are asked across the board within the learning space. And I realized maybe I work with five to 10 year olds, uh, maybe I work with nonprofits, but still a lot of these learnings are really applicable across the board. And it's really interesting to see those connections. And I think that was my biggest takeaway. Um, I think in terms of us keeping connected, there were all these like little sessions where you got to meet some of the speakers um, uh, in like a more closed room setting, which was really nice. Um, yeah. Did you did you feel like because because you are kind of 
I mean, I don't want to say outsider because that's not the right word I'm looking for. But I am. <laughs> you're kind of on the fringe of like what, mm -hmm. you know, the whole, the whole industry is about. But you're right. I mean, obviously, there's there's crossover across the board. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, what were some of those things like that was a great takeaway. But um, were there also could you tell that there were some interesting things that you added? I'm really curious about the anthropology side of it, too. And, and you know, trying to you know, maybe some of the, the myths, did you guys talk about some of the, the myths in our industry? I know that's a hot topic these days. And maybe was there anything shocking that you were like, huh, that doesn't sound right. According to what I know, those kind yeah, of things. I think, um, I think just in general, I think one of the things that sort of surprised me was, or could be done differently. Um, I realized like more than 75% of the speakers during day one, two and three, um like only 30 percent were people who represented like diverse communities of color um and i think for me that was very surprising because that's very different in our side of the world um where we um in terms of practitioners and people on ground people who work in sort of grassroots learning spaces um and i was just curious to know like whether that was sort of representative of the industry as a whole, whether we are, I mean, everybody's struggling with representation issues um, and how do we bring, because um, obviously there are issues of who has access to these learning spaces of master's programs in learning experience design, uh, PhD programs in learning experience design, or who even has access to colleges to get a degree in education, whatever that means. Um, so I think that was one of the things that, that got me thinking um, mm -hmm. of who sets the agenda um, who decides what are the topics that we're going to talk about or focus on. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think your description there of uh, it, probably you could look at almost any conference in our space and see a very similar ratio of, of, of representation, um, which is something that we really do need to, to improve upon um, and, and open up a space for, for more, you know, not just diversity of, uh, you know, ethnicities and backgrounds, but diversity of ideas and experiences too. Bring social economic forward. status. Yeah, of yeah like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All of those things are important because we can, we can definitely get our mindset kind of sort of siloed in, 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 in ways. And we need to, ha we all benefit from, from broader experienced uh, views and, and just, you know, even the discussions and, and, and building bridges, that sort of thing for sure. Yeah. As Kim is noting in the chat, who sets the agenda is a great question. It is. Yeah. Yep, totally. I think it's it's as a as a a former uh, producer of DevLearn <laughs> um, and 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 uh, official agenda setter. I can tell you that it is not as easy as you might think, and it's not as nefarious as you might think either. <laughs> I mean, it's not. Um, one of the hardest things I will tell you uh, that I ran across, and, and you kind of mentioned this a little bit, Latarsha, in, the, in you know, your setup and introduction is just, you know, there's this stigma of, ooh, ah, look at all the people that speak these things. I'm not worthy to go in there and speak those things, you know, and, to, and I don't have anything to say. <clears throat> and I, it took me a really long time to convince a lot of people, and it was a real struggle to call people up. I could see the work that they were doing, and I would say, hey. I would love for you to come and present on that. And I would always get sort of the same uh, feedback. Oh, I can't, I'm not like those other people. I don't have as much to say. I'm not as important as they are. And I, I had to constantly tell people, you are, you are probably more important than they are because this is a unique thing that you've done. You are a unique person. You have unique perspectives and we need those fresh faces and constantly trying to convince people to speak and they're, they're fearful, which is legit, mm -hmm. right? The fear of speaking is like next to death. So I, I get it. And, you know, and it's tough, but um, yeah, it's, it's really hard. And I, I think something like 30 under 30 and the mentoring and all of you sticking together and staying together and trying to stay connected, I think is something that is going to be super helpful, but of course it has to be managed. It has to be nurtured. And it, I, it's fun to see Mel Milloway here because she was a uh, 30 under 30 and, um, you know, to get all of the different classes throughout the years of the 30 under 30 to try to get them all together and you guys can mentor each other and, 
you know, the, the older classes can mentor the younger classes coming in and things like that and really start to help uh, the events. In my opinion, when I was producing events, the events weren't about getting big names up on the stage. They were about, about practitioners talking to practitioners and learning from each other in the work that they do. You, you, can ha you can be a very poor or a very brand new speaker and still have something to say. Maybe your presentation isn't 100% great. I never cared as a, as, as a producer of an event. I know we had some people who were stodgy and would be like, oh, they, you know, this person didn't present like this and they didn't do that. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> the content, was the content good? Oh yeah, the project she was working on was fantastic. I loved hearing about that. I'm like, then why, why be so persnickety about everything? You know, cut people some slack. So I don't know how they're doing things now, but that was always my take. It was get people, get people in the industry together to talk no matter if they've written a book or not if they if they're 50 if they're 20 if they're you know whatever so that's my that's my <laughs> rant for the but, day <laughs> so, latasha when you were describing oh you know that that person i i went through the same thing um you know the first few conferences that i went to you're walking uh, down the hall and you go oh wait that's that blog you know, that person whose blog I, I feed, I, you know, you know, the eight people who I obsessively, you know, scan through my blog, my RSS feed, uh, you know, every night just to find out who's posted something new. And oh, my God, those people literally are so smart. Um, no. and, and, and you're thinking, oh, and then you end up, you know, um, the best part, I guess, of, the, of, of a conference being a, attending live is the you end up being able to sit in a, in, in a, in a, in a room and have a beer with somebody or, or you, know, you know, that kind of breakdown of that of that barrier and you get to chat a little bit and, and uh, you know at least rub elbows if not actually have a really huge conversation etc and um, and yeah and eventually you get to be you know also nervy enough to actually start submitting to, to speak it you know um, I think that's it, so true too <laughs> yeah yeah oh, for sure bad. yep there we go Congress and I will back. say like for me um, when I first spoke the, my very first time speaking I I think it was either learning solutions or dev learn and I was so nervous because I was like, I've never spoke in front of people uh, at a conference before. And also, I'm so new. Like, you know, yeah, I don't know I what it. year yeah. I was at. I was so new. I'm like, what can I teach them that they don't already know? Um, and so I was so nervous. I, 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 was, I was so lucky that at the time my, I was co-presenting with my manager and she had done it before and she she presents all the time. That was her job. She was a facilitator. So she was very like collected and I'm like stressed out. I was like, this is about to happen. People are walking in. Um, my heart was pounding. Um, I was like, I might pass out. But at the end of the day, like the thing that really surprised me is that once I started talking, like my fear, because I felt comfortable talking about my the topic at hand, right? Once I start talking about whatever I'm developing or whatever I've ever created, I get super excited. And so I kind of forget that people are kind of there. I just kind of nerd out by myself in my own little bubble. <laughs> yeah, that's um, the ticket right there. Yeah. And and I think that's one of the things that I, I for me, now that I've presented at conferences, I want other people to do the same. I want people that I've literally told so many of my new coworkers, like, they're like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? I'm like, you got a proposal? We can work on it together. You can go present. Yeah. Like, I think it's one of the things yeah. that I enjoy. I love teaching people what I know. One of the things that I stress so much to um, the people I work with is if I know something, I don't need to keep it for myself. I, I'm not trying to get anywhere. I, if the table's not big enough, we can make a bigger table if we need to go to a bigger place. Because at the end of the day, I found that I learned so much more from those around me. So why can't I bless someone else with that information? Why mm -hmm. can't I, um, I'm really good at building things. I am a doer, like that is what I love to do. So most of the time when something needs to get done or built or someone's trying to troubleshoot, you know, they come to me and I'm like, yes, let's do this together. Let me show you how you can like check yourself, create a checklist when you're, when you're developing. So that way you can, you know, see where you went wrong. Oh, did I, did I set this trigger? Did I, did I, did I add this accessibility? Did I, what pieces do you need to add? And I think, yeah. you know, presenting has given me the confidence to do a lot more because at first I used to always, imposter syndrome is really, <laughs> it is really strong. It's real. And I think yeah. 
It really is. And I think that's one of the things that I have to constantly work at. Um, but I, I find that I will probably keep speaking just because I love it. I love meeting the people. I love getting the opportunity to share my knowledge. And I love when people come up to me after a conference, like, oh, I love this. Or they message me on LinkedIn and say, I use what you taught me in my project. My mind blows up. I'm like, what? Really? Can you share the project, please? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I just enjoy that piece. So I encourage everyone, if you have something, I present on it. Even if Kavi, you are you going to start person. presenting? I think I, I, I presented like research conferences with kids, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think, um, after this conference, honestly, um, I I'm think like, yeah. I think there's something interesting here. I really do. I I think there's got to be a way we can take what you know and your experiences with kids and figuring out a way to create put together a creative presentation on how all of that applies to adults or what pieces of it apply, can apply to adult learning theory or whatever. Or maybe it's just a question. Maybe it's just something that people ponder, right? And to have somebody, because I'll tell you what, these conversations do happen all the time. The difference between pedagogy and andragogy, right, is, is, is you know, pops up yeah. all the time. But there's never an actual pedagogist in the room, somebody that actually works with the kids right it's always us instructional designers and e-learning developers and l d types in corporate america you know just going off of our own experiences so mm -hmm. um you know that that's why i thought this would be really cool and i'll have to connect you with a friend of mine uh who is really big into anthropology too it was his uh we love nerding with anthropology <laughs> yeah he's in, he's in well, l d too even just that angle that uh, that you bring coming from you know a, a very different you know um theoretical background of, of anthropology would be a really awesome, uh, you know, session to hear how that influences or how you use those tools. Um, mm -hmm. I think, and there's obviously lots of overlap with things that, uh, that, you know, what many of us as instructional designers already do, et cetera, but always, uh, you know, really cool things that we can add on as layers and, and additional things to, um, to, 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 to put into practice. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe just let's to, get you two uh, together to do a presentation. Let's, let's put some, maybe a, <laughs> A creative accounting for five-year-olds or you know, something like when that. when Latisha was talking about, um, <laughs> like, imposter syndrome and, like, how she went about, like, doing that presentation, I was like, I'm going to record that and play to myself <laughs> the next time I, like, go for a presentation because that's, you need that, right? Like, you need people around you to be like, no, like, what you say mm -hmm. was is interesting. It's important. It'll help people think in a different way or do something in a different way. There's always somebody you can help. I always thought of it. I, I always reduced expectations for myself when I went up there. And, and this might help you guys or, or somebody in the chat too. I always think to myself, if there's one person in this room of 30, 40, 100, 1,000, whatever, that connects the dots to something that I said and it helps them, then this was successful and I was, I'm glad I was here. So I mm -hmm. always kind of set the bar there for myself and uh, it, and, you know, thought if that could happen if one person came up and said what you had mentioned somebody said to you afterwards or latarsha somebody hooking up with you on linkedin saying wow i actually applied that then you're right makes you feel good and it was totally worth the effort yeah for for, for me the probably the best part about doing a session was when it's over not because you're you're done but because oh my gosh there's you know three or five people here who come up and want well, well about that and, and you get to continue that conversation you know down the hall and you're learning from them because they're bringing something uh, you know oh they've got a slightly different you know problem or or whatever um that uh, that that sense anyway that you've you've at least struck a chord with with a few folks and that immediate feedback of someone coming up and wanting to talk to you afterwards um sure helps you feel um you know that you, what something you've done has been you know is you're putting out something valuable there uh, that folks can connect to and or some of the folks do need for sure yeah indeed where so what's next for you guys mm -hmm. what's uh, i don't even know who wants to take this first but uh after this experience now you're fresh off of the 30 under 30 at the event learning some stuff meeting everybody oh uh, to latarsha's point in her introduction what do the next five years have in store for you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who wants to go first 
Well, Jay, you seem like you've written a good answer to that question, so I want to give it to you while it takes some time to think. <laughs> I don't know if I've written a good answer. Um, well, no, um, so I am really big on like tools, like authoring tools, um, the doing, the the process of changing behaviors. That is something I'm really into, and so. Um, and according to my five to 10 year plan, I would love to be doing something um, as a, in the e-learning strictly area, right? I find so much joy. I love teaching people. So I would love to be the person that research what tools we have, how to enable my team to use them efficiently, or what tools do we need to get rid of or add as technology and innovations change things. Um, but I think overall, like right now, like in the next coming months, one of the sessions that I really enjoyed um, was about adaptive learning. And I enjoyed um, a, a session about workflow learning and um, using chat box, like the, those few sessions. Um, Cause at DevLearn, I, I kind of attended sessions similar to that. One of the things that I think I struggle with as a person that's fairly new to being a learning experience designer is we do so much work, right? We push so much enablement to our learners, but like, are they retaining anything? Um, there's so much content out there. And so for me as a learner, I'm overwhelmed. So I can only imagine how my learners mm -hmm. feel. And so I think in the next coming months, I'm gonna see how my team and I can kind of think about how to use some of these tools like Chatbox or workflow learning or um, moment in need, right? How can we utilize these these tools to really help engage our learners so that they are doing the best they can, right? How can we help them where, where they can ask questions through a chat box, where they can get work um, job aids, or they can get materials right then and there. They don't have to go through this massive library of content. Um, because I feel like we put so much effort into the work we do. And we're like, okay, here's this hour long training, go, go conquer. They're like, no, no, I can't do that. So figuring out a way to really help them in changing those behaviors, that's something that I've been really interested in the last few months after attending DevLearn and going to those sessions and now going to learning, um, the Learning 2021 conference. I just was like, we need to figure out a way to really apply this. And so that's kind of like where I'm at um, right now. So I'll pass it back um, to you, Kavi. <laughs> Thank you for giving me time. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I think what you said really inspired me because there's this particular sort of question that you were in the quest of, and that got me thinking. Um, so I think um, with kids, um, I work in the social emotional learning space. Um, so really looking at how can we help kids understand their emotions, um, be attuned to their emotions, and figure out um, what they need at a given point, what kind of support do they need, uh, which is social emotional learning in a, in a nutshell. Um, and one of our big questions is, can we measure social emotional learning? Um, can we measure empathy? Uh, how can we measure critical thinking? Uh, and I guess these are also questions that are being asked in the learning and development space. Um, how can we measure retention? What does retention look like? Um, what is engagement? Is it completion? Is completion engagement? Um, and these are the exact questions we ask ourselves when we design for kids. Um, and I think for me, um, uh, I work in sort of the applications of machine learning for this question. So I think um, this will be my big, big quest for the next, I guess, even three years. Can we not measure it in a way of telling kids, oh, five points, like your empathy is at level three. Not in that sense, but really, how can we create learning experiences for kids that lead to good outcomes uh, that help them stay happy? So I think if we crack this question, I think there are lots of applications even within learning and development for adults. So I think that's my big quest. I think of the next three years, five, I don't know. That could be another <laughs> You know, I don't know. Um, Kavi, I think you found your topic for presenting. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Listen, I was listening to you and I was like, oh, this like really is inspiring me. Like, what's my big question, right? See how so, easy this is? Come on. Right. You just figured out your topic. Like, just let us come here you... like once a, once in six months and the two of us can just like brainstorm and we'll have a Yes. Question. There yep. we go. 
There we go. We started Brilliant. something. <laughs> and, and truthfully, um, we, we think about in our industry very often about the information or the knowledge that people need to have and the emotional aspect of, of learning um, is often not even a consideration. Um, and yet common sense says that, you know, if people aren't in a good space or you haven't created a, a space where they can, you know, learn um, safely, at least, you know, safely taking on the challenges that, that you know, heavy learning can often can, can, can present, well, we're not going to get great results if, if we don't have that consideration of um, the emotional aspect of uh, the learning process and, and you know, where people are at, you know, when they're encountering your content too. So yeah, totally. There's a conference session for you right there. <laughs> we, yeah, we do know from the brain research too, that like that, that sort of shock and awe, mm -hmm. like leads to very strong learning. So unless you emotionally impact somebody, you're going to have to work a lot harder at getting that, uh, getting that learning to stick, but it's not as often as easy as it is, especially when we're dealing with compliance training and all that really fun stuff that we do yeah. in our world. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> thing, uh, was about, uh, did some work around redesigning, um, uh, sexual, um, like harassment training for colleges. I'm like, wow, like there's so much that can be done with that. Um, and we don't even look at that as a space for like innovation, creativity, because it's again, teaching people empathy and social emotional mm -hmm. learning. Um, yeah, but just yep, remember totally. that we mentioned that about compliance training. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a lot to be sure for us to be talking about, but we seem to be running up against the clock. Mm -hmm. Sorry, folks. So I'm going to go ahead and press that button. We got about a minute and 45 seconds to wrap up. So thank you so Excellent. much, you guys, for hanging yeah, out with Yeah, thanks so us. much, guys. This um, was super be sure to Be sure to toss in your contact info uh, into the chat in case people want to connect with you, you know, on LinkedIn or whatever your, wherever your favorite places are. Um, and thanks so much for joining us. This has been a really cool conversation. Um, and, uh, yeah, don't be shy yourselves and others listening to submit for conferences. We need to... We need more voices. We need different voices. We need different yep. ideas and different angles uh, to, to make sure that we're all improving and not just staying in a in a siloed lane at all, for sure. Yeah. Um, happy Thanksgiving to everybody in the U.S. who's um, who's got that going on, and for the rest of us in the rest of the world, a happy non-Thanksgiving, I guess, for the next happy, couple of days. Happy all the Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah. Happy email our... silence. <laughs> yeah, we've got our uh, our next few idiotics are coming up, but we will yep. be uh, ending for the Christmas holidays too, just so everybody knows. Yep. Uh, so early just, in. Yep. Yeah. And um, if you want to as well, folks, I don't know. Um, oops, I just. Ooh, I don't. Do have you have it link. handy, Brent? Uh, I can get it real fast. Oh shoot! I've got it. I just accidentally okay. deleted it, but brought it back. Don't forget, right. folks. We do have the the LinkedIn group for the idiotic sessions too. Join us there and uh, stay connected with us, etc. And maybe at um, some point everybody. we'll have a 40, almost 50 group ready for everybody. <laughs> Something like that. I can't even apply for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for your time today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.